principles within the UN of human rights, gender equality, and the advancement of women. And what else could we do um, from our vantage points to ensure accountability of the, the funds that we are able to allocate and the programming that we're able to design? So thank you very much, Louise, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, the UN is always on the spot. You know? So in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's an easy task to be, to be on the spot again. But, you know, it, I was thinking how to address the, the issue of accountability because even the term accountability is so, so misleading. You know? it's, it's so difficult to grasp. It's so technical in a way. You no, know? and by, by accountability, we can understand everything and nothing. You know? So speaking, let's say, on, on behalf of, of a United Nations agency, I was thinking, OK, which are our foundational texts you know, to which we are accountable to? And I think that we tend to forget that our foundational test or document is precisely <coughs> the charter of the United Nations. A charter that was agreed in 1945, you know, after the devastation of the world. A text, a document that was agreed by 50 countries at that time that agreed that never, never again the world should go through the same, the terrific, the horrendous experience, experience of the world, of the world, war, of war, you know? and, and after all these years, we have more than 193 member states that are, you know, have signed the same char charter that was endorsed in 19, uh, 45 in San Francisco, San Francisco, the U.S., and this, in a way, in a way, was was, you know, made me think about, you know, how to respond, you know, after all these year years to this diversity of member states, to this diversity of cultural, religious, political economic context. Of course, you know, having on one side the, the, the United Nations Charter as well as the United, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights as the basis of our work and as the basis of our response, institutional response <coughs> to uh, gender justice and also in, in as, as relates to working and engaging with, with men and boys. And, uh, you know, the, the easiest way, in a way, you know, to address uh, uh, accountability from an institutional point of view is, you know, precisely referring to our institutional frameworks, to our indicators, to our targets, etc. But I, I would like to start from, from a different point of view or from a different uh, perspective. And in that sense, you know, taking again into consideration the UN Charter and the UN Declaration on Human Rights as our basis, I think that UNFPA in particular has been accountable for the implementation of the ICPD program of action. And yesterday, I was a little bit concerned when one of the speakers referred to, you know, the, the program of action as a, as a, you know, landmark, you know, uh, 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 event or landmark document in which, okay, we, we had just uh, approached uh, uh, gender <coughs> justice or working with, with uh, men and boys from a health perspective. Because for us, it's much more than that. Much more than that. And I would like to, to, to refer to, uh, uh, to Kate Stillmore, UNFPA uh, executive, uh, Deputy Executive Director, when she referred to the program of action as the space 
you know, as, as this landmark event, landmark document, landmark agreement to which we were touching on the most intimate, you know, spaces related to human rights as regards to sexuality and reproduction. <coughs> and 20 years later, 20 years later, when we know that the CEDO, for instance, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, is the UN document most ratified or with the, the most, the highest number of ratifications. But when we look at the document, and when we look at you know those paragraphs or those articles that have been most objected by countries, those articles are related to these intimate spaces, you know, regarding sexuality and reproduction. Are those articles related to child marriage? Are those articles related to sexual and reproductive health? Those articles related to, you know, sexuality and reproduction? So I think that, that this is the main accountability framework UNFPA has been trying to make a reality over the, this last 20 years. And in that <coughs> sense, I, I, I think as well that, you know, even, even though we are quite critical in terms of how men and, and boys are reflected in the program of action, and many of us think that, you know, in a way, it's, it's uh, the, the, the way men and boys are reflected there can be uh, uh, interpreted as, as a very instrumental way in terms of how we engage with men and boys in order to improve uh, women's uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health or in order to improve uh, gender, gender equality. We also feel that over these last 20 years, in this journey, as, as Osvaldo was referring to, to implement the program of action, we have also been able to move forward. And we have also been able to, to start looking at men, not only you know, in, in their capacity or their ability to improve women's status, but also as right holders, as regards to their own sexuality and their own reproduction, as regards as their own sexual and reproductive rights. So to me, this is the main you know, uh, uh, accountability space UNFPA has been able to move forward. And uh, honestly, I have to say that my feeling, and I have been working in, in four different UN agencies, UNFPA has been leading in this particular area over the last 20 years. When you look at the, you know, the research studies, when you look at the first masculinity studies, when you look at the first workshops we organized 15 years ago, 10 years ago, in different countries, when you look at the first uh, programs and projects to address men and boys, most of them were supported by UNFPA. And this is also, you know, a, 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 to me, a, 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 you know, a, an accountability, let's say, a, a indicator. Right now, we have more than 65% uh, of, our, of our programs, of our country offices, you know, are advancing or are engaging with, with men and boys through research, through capacity development, through, you know, many South-South cooperation, etc. More than 80 countries, you know, 80 country offices, UNFPA country offices, are working with men and boys. Of course, we have a long way to go. Of course, there is still, uh, uh, you know, very much to do. But in our, for instance, in, as part of this journey in our new strategic plan for 2014 and 2017, we also made a, a substantive change. 
for the first time, we have acknowledged, you know, the importance of working with men and boys, not just to improve gender justice or gender equality and women's rights. We have acknowledged for the first time the importance of working with men and boys and particularly adolescent boys to address their, their own needs, demands, and rights as rights holders. And for us, this is also an accountability indicator. And this has been a challenge internally because not all UNFPS staff, not all our colleagues agreed with that. Many of them said, no, we need to continue focusing, prioritizing women and our work with women. And we said, yes, of course we are going to do that. But it's time, it's high time also to start looking and addressing, you know, and engaging with men and boys from, you know, a different perspective. So these are some of, you know, how uh, from commitment, these global commitments, you know, the UN Charter, the UN uh, Human Rights Declaration, the Program of Action, we have been able to address, as, as Kate was saying, human suffering and at the same time upholding human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis. I, I'd like to actually just go ahead and open it up now and take a few questions and um, then to return to the panelists. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to call out. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, my name is Kate Buchanan from the Athena Consortium. Um, that was a really, really, really fantastic panel. Thank you so much. Um, something that I've been thinking about the last couple of days and the last few years, I suppose. For the last few days, I've heard men talking about their privilege and putting it aside or looking at it and deconstructing it, and um, it's not really something that I hear very often. And I've also heard men talk about stepping away or giving away their power, and or relinquishing power so that women can step into spaces that they've occupied. And so I think that's a, it's a form of accountability or it's a, it's a form of transformation, and I guess I'm interested to hear from you. How do you, how do you operationalise that? So I'm thinking about some of the contexts that I work in, which are incredibly male-dominated, and there are some men that have insights into their own privilege, and that's sort of where it stops. And there's no recognition about how those more enlightened men, um, they don't have insight into what they do next. And so I'm wondering, is that something that you guys are trying to work on, trying to provide that guidance to men about advice about how you relinquish power in really practical terms with women that you're working with on social justice issues? So Michael, you referenced there's lots of lists. Um, so do those lists, how do they manifest and, and how do you provide really practical guidance to fellow men about strategies to relinquish their power? Does that make sense? I want to build on what Kate actually just said. I'm coming from the peace movement background, nonviolent movement. And what I've seen in these movements, which are movements really about making a change and doing good and, and being better. Um, but what happens there is that there's a lot of principles um, 
that are set up on guidelines. But there's a lot of informal power going on. And this is really what feminists are talking about. You know, it's not about that we are at the meeting. It's about knowing that the actual meeting is after the meeting. You know, and this is really where I'm, I'm also talking about the UN. We have at the UN a lot of core principles. And we have a lot of written documents. And we, I was just at the Security Council for 1325. And we really have a problem in terms of actual implementation. And women are identifying it as there is no accountability mechanism. Principles and guidelines are not enough if there is the informal impunity. So that, and especially within movements, people are very uncomfortable because we want to be friendly and peaceful with each other. We're very uncomfortable calling each other out. And as a woman, it's really difficult to do that, you know, because you might get the, the silence treatment or you, you feel the consequences later on, or you're again confirming the, the kind of archetype of the critical feminist who's always angry. So it's really about having the mechanisms and the tools that are sometimes very uncomfortable. And as you were saying, sometimes you have to put people out. So my last point also is, you know, no violence is about we have to be the change or we we have to work for the change that we wish to see in the world. So my call for men engaged really is 20% and 30%. That is a quota that we use in the world, but I would like to see 50% at least. Rwanda's parliament is doing better than men engaged. So really, I think we have to you know, work for the change we wish to see in the world. So we have to reflect that on all, all levels. So I work with men and on masculinity. So I'm fully in support, but there are really some critical things we need to look at. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, when I looked at the abstract, I thought this would be a very interesting session, and it was. And um, not necessarily coming from a men-engaged perspective, but I'd like to kind of use some of the topics that were talked about today over here and apply them to more um, to other real-life uh, contexts, which are not necessarily of men-engaged. But, uh, for example, social media is something that's really big these days. And um, I'm from Pakistan, and the culture there is conservative, and you know many things can be repressive. So a lot of things won't be out there in the public in your day-to-day -day life, but they will be out, you know, expressed or talked <coughs> about or engaged with on, this, on Facebook, for example. So we have this Pakistan Feminist Forum, and a lot of young feminists will be you know, online, talking about issues, things like sexuality, LGBT issues, things like that. And a few of us uh, got together and we made our domestic violence website for Pakistani women. There were some men involved with this as well. And uh, those men claimed to be part of this initiative. But then, uh, from the same forum, a bunch of other young girls uh, got in touch with us and they were like, you know, you have this one male supporter and he claims to be part of you guys, he claims to be a male feminist, and at the same time, his behavior is problematic. Uh, people had met him in real life and was socially awkward, and they had taken snapshots of his... Um, the good thing with social media is you can get private conversations. You can get things people have posted. And one of the things this... Um, I mean, on his timeline, there was a lot of nudity. There was a lot of other things. And uh, the way he had posted it was, okay, I'm interested in sexual expression sexual identity, things which are very, you know, it's a relatively repressive culture back home, so these are not things you'd be talking about openly, but they were there on Facebook. And at the same time, he posted somewhere that, you know, would anybody be interested in casual sex? So these feminists, even though they were very liberal, uh, you know, they were really, they found it very problematic. They were like, you know, a lot of these men, Pakistani young men, boys, involved with all of this are just trying to sleep around. They're not interested, and they claim to be feminists, but this is just a way to get cozy with the girls. Um, so I'd like to know what you think of that. <laughs> I'd like to know, because I, I see you have very good standards of violence and all, but there are things which are gray areas in the middle. How does many gates see them, and how do we deal with them? Good afternoon, it's a very interesting um, panel. My name is Kam, uh, and my question, it's not for men engaged, but I think it's for everybody in the room as an activist and, and um, 
practitioners. This morning, Sri Lata Balitvata Vala said that there are hidden and invisible deep structure of organizing that reinforces patriarchal hierarchies and oppressive power systems. The way we are we are organize ourselves as practitioners in quote unquote development industries. Now we are talking about uh, accountability. How are we as practitioners, you know, activists, advocates, donors, how we are going? What we can do to reconstruct these hidden and invisible power oppressive structures that we are perpetrating, the way we work with people, the way we interact with each other, how we are holding each other accountable, and how we are holding, again, our donors accountable, our government, which there are different, you know, different power hierarchies. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, just a few more. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so this is definitely a topic that I'm interested in. I'd love to know more about what um, what the individual level is. Sorry. Okay, we can come back. Umberto Carollo from uh, White Ribbon Campaign Canada and uh, North American Men Engage uh, Network. Um, so I, I really appreciated hearing the perspectives and I think it's important for us to have this conversation amongst us men, but I wish I, we would have seen women up there um, because I think we have to just to have this dialogue together. And But I really appreciate hearing the voices of uh, the women in the audience as well. Um, and I also encourage us to look at uh, accountability in, uh, in a little bit more depth as well, not just with the women's uh, movement, but with the diversity of the women's movement. So what does it mean for us to be accountable to uh, the indigenous women's movement, to uh, lesbian, uh, bi, trans uh, women's movement, to poor women? Um, so I think we need to think about accountability in those terms as well. Um, and uh, maybe maybe we'll hear a little bit of that later on in the, the plenary this this afternoon. Um, I also want to have a uh, uh, ask uh, Michael for a quick clarification on what you said in terms of men needing to take sides sometimes in the feminist movement, and and I'm wondering about that, and and wondering if uh, when we do take sides, if if uh, we don't end up just telling some women what to do and what not to do, and whether we're we're kind of just practicing another form of patriarchy when we take that kind of uh, position, especially around issues like uh, um, human trafficking, sex trade, rights, and exploitation. So I wonder if you can uh, clarify that a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, lots of questions emerging. I don't know if you want to, if you guys want to ask questions among the panelists as well, and then. Um, respond to any of the specific questions that you're getting. But uh, let me take just a few more. Okay, just quickly. I think there's something about kind of having more of a conversation about practices and skills and the relationships within which accountability can happen. Um, because I think it's something about confronting our own discomfort with being held accountable and our own discomfort about holding other people accountable. You know, literally a, a, an interpersonal discomfort you know, and particularly in spaces like this where we're trying to be like friendly and constructive and <laughs> positive. And, you know. and, you know, like, I'm not sure I agreed with everything that was said on the panel. Would I criticize something that was said on the panel? You know, like, how would that be experienced? Would that be experienced as being unsupportive? Would that be experienced as me being like, superior or having a better, you know. So it's that kind of micro dynamics of accountability and our, how do we get more comfortable with being uncomfortable about this com the conversations we need to be in. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. I'm just going to take one more and then um, open it up again after this. Um, thanks to all the previous comments. I appreciate it. Um, I think getting into the personal, in, in this space, um, I've been uncomfortable with some of the lack of attention to um, class and language issues going on in this very space um, in India, and I feel uncomfortable sometimes saying it, but I'm saying it. Um, I 
want to go back to this issue of institutional accountability that Michael Flood brought up and kind of play him against our friend Luis Mora um, because I see a contradiction with UNFPA saying it, it's certainly true that examining masculinities benefits men and boys, there's tons of evidence, um, but if we're going to be accountable to gender equality in the women's movement, I, I mean, why is it work on masculinities just to benefit men and boys just called the plain old work you're doing, because let's be honest, well, we want to make the pie bigger, but the pie's not bigger. So that work, I think, can, I'm going to push back, can, can go outside of this, this space, because I think this space is about work with men and boys that definitely enriches their lives, but is for a purpose of changing power relationships. Um, and I think that makes us all um, very uncomfortable. And I appreciate this space in terms of the personal relationships that I think are popping out amongst us, it's a, definitely a very personal movement that most of us are in, though it's definitely an industry as well, and I thank our friend for reminding us that most of us are here in an industry trying to turn the personal into the professional. Thank you, thank you very much. So gentlemen, um, if anyone would like to start, um, please, if the floor is open. Thank you, Michael. So Kate, you asked about practical strategies for relinquishing your power, and there are lots of lists. There are kind of you know ten things men can do, or you know putting your own house in order. And I, so I wrote a report for White Ribbon Australia called Men Speak, and that is overwhelmingly about putting their own house in order and challenging the men. Around. It's about doing that homework of own relations with women and girls and other men, and complicity in sexism and our sexual practices and our uh, boycotting sexist culture and so on. Um, and I've also because I'm a frustrated librarian, I put together a, a compilation of everyone else's lists as well. So one of the one of the things on XY Online, a pro-feminist website, is a compilation of exactly those lists. Um, I want to say though, it's not necessarily so relinquishing your power is things like um, making sure that your speakers' fees are no higher than those of equivalent women, or handing over the microphone, or actually not taking up opportunities, but uh, shunting in the direction, in, shunting attention instead to female speakers or female activists. So there's ways in which to give away power, but there's other ways in which, no matter what I do, I will have privilege. Um, you know, because of my social location, um, walk into the room and be seen as more competent, authoritative, and credible, and so on, because of the occupation of the privileged social category. And so there's, so there's a sense in which you can push power to social processes that I want it. Um, second thing, I pressure on men to hold ourselves is, is dropping. I think he for she and other campaigns placate and reassure men and lower the standard for what it means for men to commit to this issue and ask very, very little of us indeed and kind of bend over backwards to soothe our foreheads and give us a blanket and say, it's not you, it's other men. And I, yeah, I think that's very, very dangerous. Um, yeah. And, and I, think that, um, I think that feminist women have good reason to be anger and men should just have to deal with that because that anger is fair. Uh, rather than the kind of self-censoring of anger that I think it's so tempting uh, to adopt. Final thing, um, taking sides of feminist debates, I think there are good and bad ways to take sides. So, for example, I'm very concerned about pornography, and I think that pornography is a powerful influence on sexual violence among young men. And in doing that, I put myself squarely in opposition to a whole bunch of feminists um, who say that, no, it's more complicated, and pornography's effects are diffuse or diverse, and there's good feminist pornography and so on. And so, in a sense, I'm taking sides, but it's not a righteous, paternalistic, dominating taking of sides, but it is a, an owning of a political position and saying, that's why I take this position, and here's, here's the basis on which I take that position. So, um, there's more to say, but I think there's good and bad ways to take sides. Yeah. Okay. I want to respond to the question regarding how, how do we deal with uh, men who are opportunistic in some way. Probably who was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can summarize your, your question as that. How can we deal with men who are opportunistic to join this movement, so to speak, or these initiatives with the purpose of actually uh, obtaining some more power or some uh, uh, directly engaging sexually with women or any other credibility to their own self egotistic interest. Um, I think that the the 
one consideration that I have is we have to uh, open, invite men to be part of this, but that doesn't mean that um, we should screen in some way who, who, who could be part, and we, we should be very careful about um, explaining and, and, and sharing what are our values. And, and men need to feel that there, that there is a culture of accountability, that it's okay to hold each other accountable to, to that's very important, and that, is, and that is okay to ask and, and, and question. And that's why it's very important, this mechanism that we have here, this accountability standards and guidelines, because it prepares us to deal with these issues, to prevent, first of all, to prevent. We want to prevent this situation, because it has happened many, many times. I mean, you just mentioned this experience. In many of our organizations, men uh, that are part of this uh, movement and initiatives have done some of the terrible things. And, and I have one experience, experience from, from my uh, country, in Nicaragua, in which one, uh, one man who was very dear, very close to us, uh, happened to, we received complaints about he was uh, engaging with adolescents uh, uh, sexually. And as part of his mentoring, he was su supposed to mentor in the